are we doing the intro over the music? It, it actually took me by surprise to be, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to go straight into my spiel and then it was like, oh, okay, there's the theme tune. Okay. Should we, should we, should we have a do-over? Yeah, yeah. Let's <laughs> I run the theme tune? Okay, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, go on. Hello and welcome to the Cloister Bell podcast. Uh, in this podcast, we will be discussing the Big Finish audio adventure, The Mavellan Grave. The TARDIS Cloister Bell. Imminent disaster. The Cloister Bell? Yes. What's that? Well, it's a sort of communications device reserved for wild catastrophes and sudden calls to man the battle stations. That's the Cloister Bell. Don't worry about that for now. It's not really terribly significant. The Cloister Bell? Oh, no. Oh no. oh no, they're back. It's about time. <laughs> Seriously, it's about bloody time. It's about bloody a, time. Yeah, it's it's been a long gap uh, since our last podcast. Uh, and in all seriousness, Rob. What happened? I'll get on to that in a second. Uh, but what was the last podcast that we did? I can't remember. Well, it was Storm Morning. Oh, of course it was, yes. Storm Morning. Oh yeah, that was a good podcast, that one. The sun was shining. Yes. It was lovely. It was, well, yeah. Actually, that's how long ago it was. it was. It was a different season. It was summer when we recorded that, and now it's autumn. Um, mm. Yes, well, uh, hello, listeners. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for being incredibly patient with us and sticking around and tuning in. I'm Liam, and the uh, the dulcet tones of uh, the the other chap that you heard is Rob. How's it going, hello. Rob? I'm fine, thank you. Good, good. Yeah, the the reason between um, the gap, it it it's more my fault than than anything. But you know, life got in the way. Um, th- there was didn't this... didn't uh, like suggest. Nah, let's not do it this week. The odd night. Yes, that's true. Uh, so there was, so originally it was your fault, Rob. <laughs> but then, yeah. Uh, well, what? So yeah, it was just one of those things of just going. Uh, think things got in the way, and it was just re- rescheduling, and then there, there was a clash of stuff happening and then we'd uh, settled on a day uh and then uh so some really good news rob um oh uh i'll be starting a new job shortly oh so the th- uh so the thursday just gone i handed my notice in uh, with my current job role with oh, uh, <laughs> that feel good i've got to admit it it did yeah. um yeah i got uh i got headhunted it's happened very quickly it was only about three weeks ago i think if i've got the time scale right uh i got headhunted um saying oh we've uh come across uh your employment history and all the rest of it you seem like a good fit for this job opportunity we've got um they provided me with a bit of information there was a bit of backwards and forwards uh with me asking questions getting all the detail that i needed <clears throat> And then it was yep. like, yep, that sounds really good. I'm um, very interested. Uh, Pass my details on. They did. Then they wanted an interview. Uh, this was on a Wednesday. And they went, well, we, you can either have the interview uh, tomorrow or Friday. Um, and I went, uh, well, Friday, please. I uh, wanted to give me time to prepare for the interview. But there was also like other practical things getting in the way. Um, and that was falling on when we scheduled to record the podcast. And obviously I was oh, thinking, uh, I need to focus on job interview. Sod the podcast. Uh, so that was, <laughs> that was the reason for that. Anyway, obviously, uh, interview Friday got f- uh, got told the uh, early the following week, the job's mine. So yeah, it's... Well uh, done. Yeah, uh, I'm over the moon. It's a damn good job as well. Oh, that's uh, great. I'm sure the listeners have got loads of questions like exactly how much pay is it? Where is it? And all this. But uh, any <laughs> specifics that you could share with us? I'll share with you, Rob. Uh, okay. With all due respect to the listeners, it's personal information and they don't need to know it. Um, so, so, yeah. So uh, this next bit where I tell you the information of that uh, will be edited out of the podcast. <laughs> so anyway, there'll just be a moment's silence. Oh, excellent. Well done. Thank you very much. Yep. So looking forward yeah. to that. Um, welcome back, listeners. Um, I, I'm so proud you got a job as a male gigolo. Oh, thanks, Rob. Oh, yeah. sorry, we're back. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's not for everyone, but you know, I thought I'll uh, I'll give it a go, and uh, you know, the, it turns out there's a there's a bit of a niche in the market which I'll be uh, tapping into. So yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, I just think of the horrible mental images that our listeners are having to conjure up with that one. Um, anyway, yeah. So quickly moving on from that, then what happened uh, w- with all that was. Um, 
I was down in London uh, for a few days. Uh, ended up yeah. staying there a little bit longer than I intended because of the bloody rail strikes. Um, uh, my my train was cancelled and there was no way of coming back, so I had to stay in London uh, an extra day, which wasn't cheap. <laughs> no. I don't I don't want to talk about that bit, but uh, the rest of it was uh, was really really good because um, I was down there for the James Bond 60th anniversary celebration. So saw some of the films at the British uh, Film Institute, the BFI, which is fantastic. If anyone hasn't been, uh, it's a great cinema. Uh, mm. Definitely check it out. But it was great. So I saw Doctor No. Is that your first visit? Yeah, yeah, that was my the first BFI. visit to the BFI. Yeah. Oh, and of course, being on the South Bank, bit of a Doctor Who connection uh, with some of the buildings around there. Just you, know, you can't help it. Just going, uh, bits of frontier in space was recorded here. Hmm. You know all the, you know where the prison comp- complex is and that, um, the, yeah. all that concrete building. It's it's yeah. that basically. Um, so yeah, the, a big the, concrete. Was it a car park? Yeah, there was a bit of a it's car park. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but inside's lovely, and uh, yeah, great location. So I saw um, Doctor No, the Spy Who Loved Me in the Living Daylights. There, um, Doctor No was presented by the producer Michael G. Wilson. They got John Glenn, who was the editor of the Spy Who Loved Me, to present that film. But I never knew this. He actually directed the pre-title sequence, so he was talking about that, and he would later go on to direct all the '80s Bonds. Um, the Living Daylights was great because that's my favorite Bond film, and David Williams was there, and he was interviewing Mariam uh, Diabo and Art Malik, who are two of the the film stars, and they were talking about how they got a bit about their career, how they got into the film, their experiences of, f- of filming it. It was it was really great, and they joined us, uh, the audience, in watching it as well. And everyone was just in high spirits. And then when the title sequence came on and with their, with their names appearing, because they were there in the audience with us, everyone was just cheering, giving them a huge round of applause. And everyone was oh. just enjoying the film. Yeah, it was great. It was great, great fun. Uh, then there was another event where it was the visual uh, effects and uh, stunts of the James Bond films. Um, so they had a, a stuntman and the visual effects supervisor, Chris Kobold, uh, talk about it. And that was interesting. Uh, learned a couple of things. There was one. Th- there, there was there's one moment in Skyfall which I thought was a composite of partially doing uh, the the thing for real, and then a lot of really really good model work. Um, but it turned out that no, the whole thing was done for real. And Chris Cobel talked about that. And it's the bit in. You've seen Skyfall, haven't you, Rob? Uh, yeah. You know the bit when um, Bond's chasing uh, De Silva through uh, through the underground. And he almost catches yes. him, and then there's that explosion, and the, and then the train. The train comes through. Yeah, uh, so that was that. That that's the moment. That whole thing to do with the train was done for real. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I always thought it was visually impressive, but I'm even more impressed with the scene because um, so Chris Coble was the the guy because he was talking about uh, one day he just received a phone call like late at night or early in the morning, um, saying right we we need to think about this. You know, this is part of the movie, but it's missing. We want this big sort of action set piece, right? It's up to you to think about it. So he he was the one who conceived of that moment. It's like, right, okay, practically, how we how do we do it? So the initial plan was to get a a decommissioned uh, tube train and just use that, save them the cost of building it. But actually, they weigh like something like sixty tons. It's it just it was like, uh, okay, we can't do that. So they they built. Uh, they built their own version, still very heavy, a couple of tons, but obviously a lot lighter. And then that's uh, connected to a um, uh, sort of like a gimbal. It's it's all connected. And then um, you then get it moving and it's traveling at 30 miles per hour. I don't know whether if anyone's uh, clocked this, but, you know, have you ever seen that? Well, obviously, you, Rob, you said that you've seen it. You know, the the front of the train, they've actually got they've actually got the train driver. Yeah. That's Chris uh, Cobble. I'm, I'm struggling to picture that or that scene in Corrie where the same thing happens. Coronation the, Street. Yeah, I remember when the, the train came off, the tram came off the line and there was that manky awful close-up of the driver flying down and dying. Oh, no. Does that predate Skyfall? Oh, you know what? I think it might. Oh, I'm my God. So James Bond's nicking off a British soap. <laughs> 
there's Chris Kobold talking about it's his idea, and it's just like no, he ripped it off Coronation Street. Anyway, the uh, the train driver in Skyfall uh, at the front of the that that's him, that's his uh, uh, his second cameo in a Bond. Um, All right, he survived it. Yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> he survived it to tell the tale, and yeah, so. They, they get so that all that was done for real. It it was done at the 007 soundstage. Basically covered the whole thing. So when the train comes crashing through, it's it, it, they're doing it for real. It's traveling at 30 miles per hour. It crashes and so, and then when it's hanging there, it's it's like from one end of the soundstage to the other, and uh, and then the complexity of it was because they've got this thing traveling at 30 miles per hour come crashing through. They've also got a bit sort of build in how they're going to stop uh, how they're going to stop it. And that was the complicated thing, and they had they had nine things built into it um, to to slow it down. Some of it was actually built into the structure of it, so some of it's really technical, with a lot of engineering and trigger points. To the end, which is just using sandbags, so it goes from the technological to you know the complicated to the just the simple, and it works. But yeah, he was so he was talking all about that, and so I thought that was interesting. And then later, uh, one of the one of the other events uh, down there was um, I was at the Royal Albert Hall for the Sound of 007 concert, and when I found my seat, I saw him. Just uh, he was waiting for uh, whoever was going to accompany him. I went, I'm going to right, okay, I'm going to use this opportunity and collar him. So I had a chat with him. He's a really lovely bloke. And I was just saying, you know, I was there at that talk uh, and I was really impressed. And I said, I thought it was a composite of both doing it for real and model work. And he could see where I was coming from. And he said, well, actually, we could have done it through model work. But because we had to do some of it for real, I thought, well, we may as well go the whole hog and do the entire thing for real. But yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so that was cool. And the concert was amazing. Absolutely love that. Um, I know that um, the highlights are available on Amazon Prime if anyone wants to watch it. Oh, um, right, have a look. But it, it, it has come in for a little bit of flack because what was a three-hour event, it had a 25-minute interval, but it was something like three hours, has been cut down on Amazon Prime to j- just an hour. And I think they just do the songs. Although the songs are really good. And uh, we ha- it opened up with Shirley Bassey singing Diamonds Are Forever, which is my favourite Bond song. And of course, Goldfinger, and you had uh, Garbage come along and play um, uh, "The World Is Not Enough," and you had Lulu come along. I've never really liked the man with the golden gun as a as a, as a song, but you know, um, she she did a great job. She was singing and doing a bit of a performance, which was a lot of fun. And then you had other people coming in and doing covers. So Jamie Callum, uh, he he did "From Russia with Love." He did a really good job. Um, so, so that was great, but it wasn't just the songs as well. We also had like bits of the orchestra and uh, and, and whatnot. I made a friend when I was there. Uh, there were some lovely people friend. at that concert, so yeah, that was great. Um, and the day before, I caught up with a, a university friend who uh, I hadn't seen in ten years, um, apart from briefly earlier this year at a friend's wedding. It's like you know, uh, I haven't seen you so use that opportunity to do a catch up, and that was really nice. And we actually caught up at BBC Television Centre which is now all apartments and restaurants. And there's a private club upstairs of which he's a member. So he signed us both in and went there. And that was just, that was a really nice place to catch up. Really lovely uh, atmosphere. Uh, uh, And that was probably the highlight, even though I enjoyed all the Bond stuff and I went to the British Museum and I was there for a ridiculous amount of time and I loved that and the Victorian Albert Museum. Um, But that was the highlight, just catching up with someone I haven't seen for (laughs) for 10 years. It was just lovely. So... um, so yeah, that was that was my trip in London. It's all good. Sounds really cool. Apart mm. from the, the the return trip, what was the what was the return return trip like? Uh, Jam packed? No. No, it wasn't. It wasn't too bad because it was a little bit later on. In the, so yeah, the strike was on the Wednesday. I came back on the Thursday, but I got a an early afternoon train. Um, it was a little bit packed, but I mean, I had a I had a seat, so I wasn't bothered. You know, but yeah, it, it, there were some people who were struggling to to find a seat, so. Was a little bit packed. Oh, that's good. I found the uh, the Corrie tram crash actually. Um, when was it? Oh, it was twenty ten. Oh, so two years before. Yeah. So, um, hold on. There's Ken. Ken's on the floor. <laughs> right up there. Rita's down. 
brake's not working on the tram. Oh, yeah, line's broken overhead. Alright, I'll have to send you this and you can compare it. <laughs> it sounds bloody epic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think I ever saw that. I know it was a big thing and it was, uh, you know, um, it was all over the news. Big epic <laughs> Coronation Street story. Um, <laughs> never seen it. Okay, I'll watch that later on. I remember people were really pissed off because there was a big thing on the adverts, like so many people will die, like there'll be five deaths or something. And people were trying to do a head count and then there was one less and then it later it was revealed that no, it was just the driver <laughs> it was just the driver oh hang on right okay I've got your uh, so I've got the link actually I'll, I'll watch a bit of it now uh, right oh blimey about 27 seconds in or something and the tram yeah, starts yeah. okay that's a bit of a okay that was a bit of a weird shot it's a bit Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> oh, that was badly done. Some dodgy acting with the running away. Oh, does the baby die? Uh, no. no. Oh, okay, that's, uh, that's alright then. What the hell? Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, it, it's a funny one. So <laughs> comparing Coronation Street to a James Bond film. Um, <laughs> Who did it better? Uh, James Bond. I mean, that thing has, uh, you know, it has a. There's a lot of explosions and fi- there's a lot more fires and explosions and all the rest of it than the the, the train crash in uh, Skyfall, but. Um, there's there's some dodgy acting uh, in Coronation Street. Just in general, or in that scene. <laughs> yeah, just in general. But in that scene, there's some there's some dodge there's some dodgy acting. Mm. There's some odd di- sort of like camera angles and directorial choices, which just kind of like takes you out of the moment. And then the the train crash itself. Oh, it looks dodgy. Yeah. And actually, that's. Uh, I mean, obviously, they don't have the budget of a James Bond film, um, but. You can tell that actually in Skyfall it is done for real, whereas with that it's got some um, really dodgy computer imagery. Yeah, I've got a feeling it was Phil Collins that directed that particular episode. I might be wrong. I, I thought you were going to say Phil Collins there for a second. Yeah. Uh, right. One yeah. of the two. Yeah, one of the two. Okay. Uh, so, um, what's on the agenda for a day? Hmm. Oh, um, greetings and catch ups. So. Have you been doing anything apart from your little days out? Um, been going back to the gym. Um, so that's been quite good. Getting, Losing a bit of weight, getting back into better shape. So that's been good. Um, uh, but I think I have got a bit lazy with reading recently. Um, right. Okay. I haven't been doing as much as I usually do. And it's kind of start, it's gotten to the point where it's starting to bother me a bit. Um but yeah, because it does feel like there's an awful lot that's been happening. Yeah, it's, I think that's pretty much been it, really. How about you? Yes, yeah, the same old stuff. Um, not going to the gym, eating <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, what have I been watching? I watched Prey the other night, the new Predator. Oh, oh funny enough, uh, um, one night when I was down in London... Um, because I just couldn't get to sleep, and I went, "Okay, I'll I'll just put the TV on." And I was seeing what I forgot what it said on the the TV guide, but it, it was something like Agatha Christie's Poirot. I was like, "Yeah, okay, I'll watch that. That's always good." Uh, this isn't Poirot. This is Predator. Um, uh, the the first one from eighty seven, and I hadn't seen it in years. And I was like, "Oh yeah, I'm watching this. That was a lot of fun." Have we been pronouncing Predator that wrong this whole time? What do you mean, Poirot? <laughs> Yeah, must must be, yeah. Let me think, yeah. Yeah. Poirot, Poirot True Enjoy two. it? Yeah, yeah, I did. It was, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's big, 
bold 80s action cheesy as hell but i love it you know and it, uh, for what it is it is actually you know for, for, for what it is it is a very well-made film yeah, some uh, cool and it's, scenes. It's, like the... Yeah, it's got some really cool scenes. It's got some epic. Uh, you when know, they're just shooting the dialogue. rounds into the jungle. Yeah, yeah. Um... Dylan, you son of a bitch! <laughs> Get to the chopper! Um, yeah, you know classic lines like that, quotable everyday things. But yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that 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 scene when they both see each other and <laughs> got, yeah. do it, kill me now. <laughs> that wasn't me quoting or anything. Just, just saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I love Predator. Anyway, sorry. So you, uh, so you're watching the new one. Yeah, Are you good. It was fine. It, it was. I'm guessing it was a straight to streaming thing. I don't think it got a cinema, cinema release, or if it did, it was a very limited one. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Um, acts as a prequel, I guess, set in the 1800s. Um, it would work better if you didn't know what the predator was i get a guess so it it lacks the charm of the original it was a fine mm. little standalone thing with a certain connection to one of the other films predator 2 yes <laughs> yeah i'd seen the bit because i haven't seen the series but i know that there's a bit where it's like a uh, um with the gun yeah 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 so it ties into the second film yeah it was all right um i've started watching well my wife's been rewatching suits so I've been watching some of that. All right. And I've watched the penultimate episode of She-Hulk with Matt Murdock back as Daredevil. I've started The Rings of Power on Amazon, the new Lord of the Rings show. Right, okay. Uh, I wasn't going to, and... but we'll just put it on. It's fine. I wasn't excited to watch it. Um, Not necessarily excited to finish it. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. Um, it looks all right, but I'm, I'm a bit confused about to what what extent of it is original material since they're making seasons of it all based off like the appendices of the books so mm. I don't know all right okay yeah i've got a, i've got another friend of mine who he's really into fantasy and um it's it's funny because so when I when I've been asking him about it and just uh, he says that he, you know he he likes it and it's been good that there's been a tv series which is just pure fantasy uh, and although he said that he likes it, it's funny. I've, I haven't been getting the sort of the, the passion. <laughs> it doesn't, you know. He says that he likes it, but I'm not getting the I'm not getting the impression from him that you know he mm. really loves it. Mm. I know they've spent a hell of a lot of money on it. Mm. Like, I don't know. I've got the impression people have been saying it's like a a billion dollar show, but mm. um, yeah, it's not. It's not really phenomenal. <laughs> I did see a, a little bit of something. Someone posted this online. And all, and all what they were doing is just saying, I'm not talking about the the, the, the writing or uh, all the rest of it. All what I'm doing is I'm comparing how the TV series and the Peter Jackson films were directed. So that's what he's focusing on. The direction, um, blocking, and the use of camera angles. So it, and so I, I saw that and I went, okay, that, that that's actually an interesting take. So... What he was saying was, in the TV series, you've got all these amazing, very well done uh, CG images of the landscape. Um, and they're very well done. But when you look at the how the, how the, the scenes are shot and directed, uh, you're not giving a true sense of place. Because all what, all what happens is basically you've got all this green st- green screen stuff and the cgi images Mm -hmm. and the actors are just plonked there and it's basically a lot of essentially static shots yeah it's pretty much it yeah whereas in the tv series they're doing the same thing obviously some of the places were shot on location in new zealand some of it's on sets and they're having to do the, the green screen but actually what you've got is through the the use of movement and camera angles and transitioning from one place uh, in the in the set to another, you're actually getting a, a real sense of place within it, with the architecture and the landscape, and just through just through simple, really good direction, you get a sense that actually these people are in a real place, and so everything marries up perfectly. Whereas in the TV series, you don't get that because it's just a lot of static shots. Mm-hmm. So, w- would you say that? 
Yeah, that that, true. I did get that feel. And the establishing shots of all the locations, mm. they, they probably go on longer than the would in the films. Um, very elaborate shots. Um, doesn't seem photorealistic, I guess. It, it Obviously, it does look very good. But mm. um, it doesn't have the same kind of practical feel of some of the previous ones in the films. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, as I say, because I've seen some of the... I haven't seen the, the series, so I'm not talking about it in relation to that because I can't possibly comment. But from the, the clips and the scene... Yeah, from from the work that the uh, the designers and those responsible for actually creating the CGI images, I can't fault them on that because it, it, that point of view does look absolutely stunning. But the the problem does seem to be how it's how it's directed and the use of camera angles and so on. So I have seen people talking about that in the, from the technical aspect and then them actually explaining that that is preventing them from really immersing themselves into the viewing experience because they're not getting a true sense of place. Mm. The first episode did feel like it was all over the place, establishing new characters, mm. like three or more different kind of story arcs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... I don't know. I'll give it time. Um, I've also been watching the Jeffrey Dahmer uh, drama, dramatised show um, of the serial killer. Oh, okay. Interesting. That's coming for a lot of flack, that series. so I haven't heard any of that. Um, do you know why? Uh, yeah, a lot of people are... Well, the first, the first Actually, thing I, that I... Be- I do have a feeling why, but go on. Well, there's there's two things. One was because um, I think a lot of people were surprised that this series just seemed to materialize on Netflix. Because I don't, my, a lot of people seem to, th- uh, from what I can gather, it wasn't really heavily advertised, and then it was just there. The f- I became aware that this series was there when it, someone had, someone from Netflix. It must have been a s- mistake. I'm assuming it's some intern who just didn't know anything about you know this guy. Briefly read. Oh, he was gay. Uh, right, I'll, I'll put it under LGBTQ plus. So it, it, it was filed under that as a category, and then right. every, everyone's just going, "No, that's not the category to put it on." He was a not serial killer. Yeah, so that was promptly removed. So that caused some uh, con- controversy. I can't think why. Anyway, <laughs> so there was that. But then um, a lot of people are just saying that uh, it's uh, very gratuitous. Um, they focus far. I mean, I know a little bit, uh, a little about of what he did and how he killed his victims, and I don't want to know anymore. It's, it, I mean, it's deeply disturbing. Um, um, so if you're going to cover something like that, obviously you're going to go into some very uncomfortable territory. But even yeah. so, there's you know a lot of people saying that you know the, the violence and the and the depiction of what's it's very gratuitous. And it's, it seems to be a show that wants to have its cake and eat it, um, because on the one hand it's sort of doing that approach, and then the series ends of going. But remember the victims, and of course you know yes, remember the victims. That is important. But from from what I can gather from what people are saying is just going. But given the fact that it seems to be wanting to do this thing of remember the victims and and, and honor them and, and remember them, mm-hmm. the actual content of the show seems to be at odds at that. So. Yeah. Um, there's came an aspect of the show I found a bit distasteful because um, putting aside the fact that it's real we are watching a drama mm. and this guy's the main character and um, I don't know if protagonist is the right word but when you consider other shows that are completely fictional about serial killers where you are on the killer's side almost like I don't know Dexter or you um, you kind of, you kind of watching it, and you kind of at odds about what to feel because the show spends a lot of time kind of humanizing him and um, showing how he gets to where he was. Um, so I kept you kept you have, you have to like pull yourself out of it and think, wait, I'm not rooting for this person. Um, yeah, it's it's an odd one. I don't know if maybe um, it it it's a hard balance getting it right, and maybe they um, focus too much on that. I know it was his story, but yeah. 
Mm. It, it yeah, for that that last point that you made it, it is an interesting one because the, the 2004 film Downfall, which I think is a very good film, um, came in for a lot of criticism because you know it uh, it it humanized Hitler, um, and so it didn't it didn't make you sympathize or root for him, but it made him you know it grounded him and you know made him human but i actually think with a with a movie like downfall that's actually an important thing to do because uh the things of which he was responsible for um yeah it was it was horrific but if you just constantly think of him as a as a monster and a uh, in sort of like an in a boogeyman sort of sense mm. then it it removes yourself from the lessons that we have to take from these awful things which is you know these were the acts of you know, the, you know, these are the the actions of of humanity in a very dark way, and we need to be mindful of that. Um, so, yes, I, I can understand uh, it can make people comf- uh, uncomfortable, but I think with some uh, with something like that, I do think it's important. Yeah, it's tricky because well, well, I didn't empathise with him. Mm. There's like different aspects of the show, nothing to do with the killing. Where you're saying to sympathise with him as a human and. and uh... I thought, is is this this shouldn't be my takeaway from this show? <laughs> it was it was it was a bit odd, but so you know that so by the sounds of it, you uh, you know that thing I was saying that some people would be criticizing it because it you know the way that ends of remembering remembering the victims, but it seems mm. to be odds at how what the show actually does. From what you're saying, that's actually the case. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, the. <clears throat> Real life interview tapes have also hit Netflix. I think it was last Friday, so there's a there's a more of a um, documentary style um, version out now. Oh, okay. Have you have you watched that? I watched the first one, and uh, there's certain aspects that were not included or changed for the dramatized version. Understandably, you know, you have to have like a a narrative, mm. I guess, but. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I'll probably watch some more of that. Oh, okay. I will all have morbid fascinations with like serial killers. Why is it the big thing? Yeah, it's a, it, it is a bit of a Bloody funny podcast one. listeners as well. Love a bit of true crime, don't they? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I got caught up in that a, while, a few years back. Um, there was someone, one of my work colleagues, this was in a previous job, and she was massively into her true crime podcasts. And I was just sort of like, well, okay, sell me this. I find this, I find this odd. Interesting, but odd. So, um, she, yeah, and she told me to listen to one, and there was something darkly fascinating about it. Um, so there was a there was a period when I was listening to a lot of true crime podcasts, but I've, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still interested in true crime, but not. I, I think there is a. Uh, I think there is a bit of a ghoulish aspect to it, but. I think when it's done right, so um, I think this is maybe on Netflix actually. There was a do- uh, there's a documentary series about the Yorkshire Ripper, and I thought that was very well done because what it did was it it focused. Obviously, it covers what it, it goes into uh, the effects of um, the victims. Their families, their friends, but it also takes up. It also looks at the the social aspect. So, uh, the police, how they operated, uh, the mistakes that they made, um, where the investigation led, the impact that it had on society, etc., uh, etc. Et so it takes on a much gra- so it's it's not a sort of ghoulish um, thing of going these awful things happen, but let's just focus on the murders and. You know, and all the rest of it. Actually, that was a good way of doing it in the sense of you know of what it was exploring, mm-hmm. how it explored it, and it did actually provide proper focus on the victims. So you remembered the victims, and yeah, that's the way to explore these sorts of things. Um, yeah, well, the, right. the Dharma show did. Um, mm-hmm. We did get to meet the victims, um, dramatized. Um, and at the very end of the last episode, there was a there was a minute where they did re- show the faces of all the victims as well, like a moment of reflection at the end. But uh, um, so we need to say hello to Grant. Well, Grant is our latest patron. 
Fantastic. Hello, Grant. Yes, uh, thank, you, thank you very much. It's really appreciated. Um, please, you're enjoying the show for, for one thing, uh, unless it's some sort of uh, glutton for punishment and you're uh, uh, helping to support a podcast you can't stand. But uh, no, th- uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate well, it. Well, Grant's been a Doctor Who fan since 1981. Wow, okay. Uh, his his favourite food is tacos. Fair enough. And his fav- his favourite story is State of Decay. And his favourite Doctor is Paul McGann. Nice. Okay. Well, funny enough, because we're doing the season eighteen thing, so we will be do- we will actually be doing a State of Decay at some point. Um, depending, uh, eventually. eventually, depending on the sort of. Um, actually, hang on. I'm going to see. I'm going to open up the schedule. So. Okay. Uh, um, I'll in the way you're pulling that up. Um, Grant did leave a review on the website. Um. Because uh, did you know, Liam, cloisterbellpodcast dot com, you can now leave a re- review there. Ah, so you don't have to go off to Apple Podcasts, but please do or Podchaser. Um, but you can leave a review on the website. You don't have to log in. If you do log in, because you can make an account on our website. Um, if you do log in and leave a review, you'll instantly receive a virtual badge for your profile which is Adrix star well uh, no no that's great sorry just going back to the schedule so uh, all things considered and if it goes well um, we should be looking at State of Decay in 8 podcasts time oh dear <laughs> it's a little while but we will we will be getting we've done it. one in the past in the, in the space of like two months yeah so uh, we need to do weeklies, Liam. Oh, weeklies. Yeah. It says it's a weekly podcast. Like, <laughs> well, we got rid of that on the basis of false advertising. But uh, that was the idea. Weekly podcast. So, yeah. I had this bright idea, um, which I'm regretting now, but um, which was looking at looking at season 18. That's not the bit I regret. Uh, so looking at the season 18 stories, because uh, I love season 18. I think it's got some really good cracking stuff in there. Um, but I also thought... Uh, when I was, it'd be quite nice to look at Big Finish uh, stories a little bit more. And I thought, oh, I know, let's marry those two things up. Because there are um, Big Finish audio stories that are supposed to be set within season 18. But there's there's a reasonable number. I thought, well, actually, we'll, we'll do that. And I'll see if I can work out some sort of continuity. So I'm shaking my head right now. Yeah, I know. I, I kind of regret this because uh, really, I think it should have been a case of just, uh, by all means, do the big finish audio stuff. But I think you've more than doubled the length of season eight. Yes, I've more than doubled the length of it, and uh, I, I would rather just be sort of like focusing on the TV series and just doing that. So, uh, and I, did, but I, I knew that I wouldn't be doing this again, or we wouldn't be doing this again. It it only works for season eighteen. So, yeah. like, if if we're ever to do like season twenty. I wouldn't be building in Big Finish because, you know, we it, it would never end. Uh, we'd be stuck on doing season 20 for probably about five years or something, if we're lucky. Uh, so, yeah. So, that was the idea. So, we've done The Leisure Hive in terms of the televised stories. Feels like a lifetime ago. Feels like a lifetime ago. And that's it. It's ridiculous. So, um... Is that the only one we've done? T- yeah. Are you, are you serious? Yeah, I'm being serious. Oh, I thought we would. I thought we'd done a, a few of them. No, <laughs> we've done one of the televised stories, but we've done. Hang on, so, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, today's will be the seventh. Uh, I'm big shocked. Finish. I thought this yeah. has been going on for ages. We must be the, at the end of the season. Oh no, we're not. So the way it works, the Beast of Cravenos. The Eternal Battle, we've done those. Mm-hmm. Silent Scream, Death Rass. Death Rass. Yep, done those. The Leisure Hive. Yep. Done that. Mm. Uh, and then as soon as we got to the televised stories, it was like, right, sod that, back to big finish. So we've done uh, The Haunting of Malcolm Place. Yeah. Subterranea. Uh, today we're looking at the Mavellan Grave. Then, <laughs> after that, it's the the skin of the sleek the thief who stole time then folks it's megloss oh. 
and then which is a televised story. So we've second... got a couple more big finish to go. Yes, and then right, and okay. then it goes Megalos, full circle, state of decay. Okay. Then, and then four big yeah. finishes, and then uh, and then it's basically uh, pretty much a clear run for the for the rest of the televised stories. So you know we are Any, getting there. Anything goes. Yeah, yeah but uh, and, and we'll remind the listeners this is every other week or every other episode rather. Yes. Uh, because I, I I do have a say, you know, every other time. <laughs> Once in a while, I let Rob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does have a say, and I thought, yeah, cook. I think it's probably just as well, Rob, because you know there's this constant focus on season yeah. eighteen. I think it would drive us potty, so we do break yeah. it up a little bit. And there was me picking a big finish last week, last time. Yeah, so, but that was so good. Uh, yeah, I suppose. One, it's you know, it was. Um, uh, I've forgotten the name of it now. What was it called? Storm warning. Storm warning. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah and Ken- Kenny was on with us. Um, mm-hmm. And he, the next day, I thought, um, oh, he's probably just blocked us or something, but he hadn't. No, no, he was still engaging with us, so yeah, yeah. Uh, he, which was good. We hadn't put him off. I think he had a good time. Uh, we certainly did. So yeah, it was it was good, and that was the first time I'd ever heard um, that story, and I had a great time with it. Um, so yeah, yeah, um, so. Grant left a rev- review mm-hmm. um, of Christ Bar podcast. Made by fans, for fans, this podcast covers the whole of Doctor Who and it's en- entertaining from start to finish. Keep it up. Thumbs up. Thank, oh, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Do appreciate it. Thank you. So, without further ado, shall we get to the Mavellan Grave? Sure, yeah. Do you want me to pull up like a trailer or something? It's probably one on the website. Oh yes, that <laughs> good idea. It was in this trench. We removed five layers before we got to it. It was among remnants of clothing, also a small knife and a man's bracelet. The indications are that there was a violent event here, but our excavation has recovered genuine Iron Age relics. The discovery of this item... We can't explain it. Doctor, it's a Mavella power pack. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, the fourth Doctor adventures, the Mavellan Grave. Oh, the ground's moving. Something else is coming up. Your people hum. Please put him down. Oh no. What? We've got to get back to the dig. Everyone on this planet is in the most terrible danger. Oh, come on. Ugh, I'd forgotten how cold you Mavellans can be. You're serious, aren't you? If I can access these orders, we'll find out why Mavellans were on Earth 2,000 years ago. Big finish. We love stories. Well, we can't stand them. Uh, No, it's, uh, yeah... That was good. That was. I thought that was a really good trailer. So, um, in terms of the plot synopsis, um, again, Nick from Big Finish. When an archaeological dig in 1980s England finds a Mavellan power pack buried amongst Iron Age artifacts, the Doctor and Romana have no choice but to investigate, and what they discover worries them very much indeed. A Mavellan ship is buried under the ground. Soon, the robotic enemies of the Daleks are making their way to the surface, but they are not the biggest threat humanity faces. Because on board this ship is the greatest weapon the Mavellans have ever devised. A weapon that could stop the Daleks forever. And anything else that gets in their way. Ooh. So, the cast and crew. Uh, Tom Baker plays the Doctor. Lala Ward plays Romana. John Banks plays Robin Lyon. Chris Jarman plays Chenick. Camilla Power plays Carrie Pierce. John Slavin plays Mary. And Polly Walker plays Commander Narina. It was directed by Nicholas Briggs, written by Andrew Smith, uh, who wrote Full Circle, uh, televised story of season oh, 18. Uh, and it was produced by David Richardson. So um, when I uh, listened to The Mervallon Grave, um, I, just, I hadn't listened to the trailer that uh, we played a few moments ago, and I hadn't read any of the synopsis i just went completely into the story blind and um the only thing that i knew about it going off the artwork and obviously the title the mavellan grave was that it would have the mavellans in it so this sort of works 
as a sequel to Destiny of the Daleks, which was uh, the first story in season 17. And in that story, we have the Mavellans, who are uh, a robot race who function purely on logic and uh, who are have been in a war with the Daleks. Uh, so they were the Mavellans return into the story. So I was just uh, expecting a story set on a alien planet, far far future Mavellans and all the rest of it. So even though it's in the plot synopsis, I hadn't read it. So when we actually start the story and it's clearly set in England in the early nineteen eighties, I was I was surprised by that. Um, yeah, by a happy coincidence. They crash landed on Earth. <laughs> yes, um, I mean, w- when you listen to the story, Rob. I mean, had you listened to the trailer and read the plot synopsis? No, I hadn't. Okay, I just um, logged into your personal Big Finish and uh, just pressed press download. <laughs> you see, you paid for it yourself, Rob. Oh yes, <laughs> I was ta- I was talking about myself in third person. Oh, I oh okay. yeah, okay, that's fair enough. Okay. Um, so when you was it a surprise to you that uh, where the story was set? Um that didn't strike me as surprising. I don't know why. Yeah, I mean when I say surprise I mean I wasn't I wasn't shocked. <laughs> just, yeah. You know, it was just it pleasantly so it was slightly surprised. Uh pleasantly though. But yeah, I, it was just that 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 expectation of going well it's got the Mavellans in so obviously it must be set in space. Uh but the fact it wasn't was like, "Oh, all right okay um and of course we we start off in uh baker street which has been uh, established uh within uh some of the previous uh season 18 big finish stories that we've looked at yes uh the doctor and romana and k9 although k9 hasn't made an appearance for a couple of stories at this point uh but all three of them are um you know have have got their own digs in um baker street uh and there's this whole thing that um, an archaeological dig has been taking place and Iron Age artefacts have been discovered, but uh, a really odd uh, thing was was found amongst those. And it, what caused uh, a lot of uh, focus on this archaeological dig is that it seems to be technological. But of course, uh, when this is reported on the news, the Doctor and Romana recognise it instantly. And um, as the trailer and the plot synopsis earlier it's a Movellum power pack um so that gets the doctor romana straight into events gets in contact with the archaeological um uh group the the archaeolog the ar- can't get my word the archaeologists uh gets them involved you know the, uh, interacts with them and then they basically get to the the dig one thing that we we've said with a when we've been looking at these stories is because they're two episodes in length and they're both half an hour so these stories last an hour so th- um so these stories are very very quick paced and mm. uh it's, I, a, it's a tough one it's like by the time things really get going mm. uh, they're coming to a climax yeah and uh it, it some stories it has worked and we have quite enjoyed them in some instances we we felt that actually that really limited uh, the story uh, and was quite detrimental um but actually i think the mavan and grave is is one instance where it does work personally do, do, do you agree or do you think differently no in this instance i definitely agree mhm oh, all right okay um, good good um, in comparison to i can't remember the name of what we've done in the previous episodes yeah, but the, uh, the, uh, I mean, I think the oh, I've forgotten the name of the title now that you mentioned it. But the very first one that we did, I think you know, we definitely weren't a fan of that one. No. Um, uh, I'm going to see if I can. Uh, what was it? The Beast of Kravenos, That one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, and I think Deathras to some extent, if I remember rightly. Which um, one was Deathras? Uh, that's another thing as well. I th- <laughs> They're all merging. They are, they are merging. The, and the, with the exception, I would say the sign and scream definitely stands out because yeah. that you know that's the one that's set in. The, in uh, Subterranea with the moles. Yes, that was really good. I enjoyed that yeah. one. Um, but some that's the other thing as well. Some of the, the stories sort of 
come out and they don't really have that much of an identity. So I kind of for the light, I, I can't for the life of me remember what the Didn't hell. Didn't definitely Death do was. it. <laughs> yeah, no, we definitely did it. Um, but I remember this, the the sign and scream, you know, because that really stood out. There was there was atmosphere in there, and it has a unique setting, which and it uh, uses that setting as a way of telling the story, which was nineteen uh, thirties America, the end of the silent era of films. But that m- m- merges into the plot. I think that's quite good. Subterranea, which was the last story, as you said, Rob. Uh, I thought that that had a really good, strong identity, particularly with the characters, and you know, it has it has moles. Yeah. Um, oh yes, Subterranea. I'm looking at the cover now with the submarine in space and the chimp, and the 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 creatures that um, adapted. The, yeah, the Cybermen knockoffs. Um, um, oh yes, yes. Uh, you know, so you know, it, it works with stories like that. With something like Death Rass, the fact that we, I cannot for the life of me remember even what that story was, I think, you know, says says an awful lot. It, uh, you know, um, some of these stories needed probably four episodes, you know, give them breathe, you know, allow them breathe, tell the stories in a, in a much more constructive, detailed way. Um, but with something like the Mavell and Grave, it, it, it works incredibly well and it, it moves the story at a, you know, is a, a very good pace because it's a good story, but it's, you know, it's just a simple story. Yeah. Um, it doesn't rely heavily on a uh, destiny. No, that's true as well, which I think is something else, which is going, uh, going in its favor. Um, if if you've seen Destiny of the Daleks, you know that one of the ways that the Doctor uh, defeats the Mavellans is um, through removing the power packs. Uh, which, mm. in this story, it's addressed of going well. They they overcome that weakness. The the Mavellans don't immediately power down if they're separated from their power pack. Um, but that's explained very well in the writing you don't have to have seen that previous story in order for that it's all explained and not yeah. in a clunky way i think andrew smith's done a very good job of allowing that to unfold in the dialogue but in in a seemingly natural way it doesn't feel like a you know shoehorned in reference it doesn't come across as clunky i think it's uh, i think it's well written um yeah it gives the means to activate the activate them without actually seeing them first yeah yeah, which actually allows the the Mavellans to appear, a, you know, the, you know, more intelligent uh, and 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 more of a threat, and allows the story mm. to be a bit more atmospheric. You know, late, later on, I'm jumping ahead here slightly, but in the second episode, there's the thing when the the power pack, uh, which was discovered in the archaeological dig, becomes activated, and that act, you know, that you know, there's that whole thing of going, well, it's activating and it's calling the Mavellan to it, and the Mavellan, you know, mm. it's, you know, that that that's done incredibly well. Um, but yeah, we we move at a, a very quick pace uh, because no no sooner have uh, the Doctor and Romana arrived at the archaeological dig, they start using um, gadgets to, to to scan the area. And what do they discover? Um, what do they discover, Rob? Um, well, uh, Romana does the seismological scan and Mm -hmm. they find the at first the they find the Mavellan is it Mm -hmm. Commander Narvin Narva Uh, yeah well she emerges Narina I think Narina yes yeah and uh, also the the ship which is designed Mm -hmm. to burrow itself in yes Mm -hmm. uh, which was described as an inverted pyramid yeah, which which is a good description, and obviously that 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 that's a reference to what the ship looks like in Destiny of the Daleks. Um, but again, you don't have to have seen that story in order for this one to make sense. Um, so th- again, we've we've spoke about this in other podcasts as well. But to me, this is this is how continuity should be done. Um, if you are going to use something from the show and reference it do it in a way which is if you're a fan of the series and in this case you're familiar with destiny of the daleks you go oh yeah i get that reference uh that works or yeah or i know what that looks like but also if you're say for example um you're coming into big finish for the first time and you pick up the mavellan grave as a yeah sounds interesting and you haven't seen destiny of the daleks 
still works. Um, mm. You know, bogged down by you know listening to a story where you feel like you're massively missing out on something. It's, it's all explained and done incredibly well. So, yeah. Um, does Destiny of the Daleks establish a time in history when it takes place itself, regardless um, of this story? Off the top of my head, I don't think it does. Right, just because this kind of this kind of does because the Mavellans went back two thousand years, hmm. and the commander states that this is a point, um, possibly before that when um, they can use this foreknowledge to um, to kind of make changes. You know, when the doctor's going on about making a time paradox. Yes. So that that kind of statement places destiny um within the 1980 after 1980s before um before that 2000 year threshold. Mhm. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's interesting actually. I hadn't thought of that. But yeah, you're you're right. It it does place uh does place destiny within a, a particular Yeah. And w- when did you imagine like Genesis and the Daleks to take place? I always presumed it was a long time ago. I know it's kind of a mystery and irrelevant. Yeah. Obviously, in relation to where that story set, which is Scaro, I thought it was a, I thought it was a long time in the past. Obviously, it makes mm-hmm. sense because, you know, the type of story it is. But I didn't think... But I thought from from our perspective... Oh, and obviously it's It'd before... be in the future... Um, but it would be before twenty one. Well, I don't remember. Dalek invasion. What, yeah, which was twenty one fifty in the movies, but not quite in the TV show. Um, yeah, so yes, it puts it before that time, before the um, the twenty second century. Yeah, hang on, I'm just trying to think. How does um, what's the opening text of the Star Wars films? A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, a long, yeah. Do you think they should have opened um, like that for the Daleks or Genesis? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it would work if it did. I think it would yeah. make sense in the galaxy. F- Hang on, what is it again? A long time ago, in a gal- galaxy far, far away. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm giving myself a headache now because I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Can you tell I'm a massive Star Wars fan? <laughs> Just if there's anyone who's invested, to just go. How did? How can you not remember that? <laughs> Actually, Rob, just when was the last time you watched a Star Wars film? Quite recently, because there was a new Obi Wan Kenobi TV show, a limited series with Ewan McGregor, uh, which was oh, on Disney yes. Plus recently. Yeah, yeah. Um, so leading up to that, my wife hadn't watched any of the Star Wars TV shows, um, because we had the Mandalorian and the Book of Boba Fett. Mm-hmm. Um, she's had no interest in that but you know we're like Ian McGregor so um, I said well why don't we watch the Star Wars films we ended up watching them all in chronological order minus the TV shows that were already on mm-hmm. um, and then we watched Obi-Wan uh, um, so yeah I've seen I've seen them all um, when I say we've watched them all we've watched all the, the spin-off films as well um, which I guess puts it up to about eleven films, I think. Uh, mm, mm-hmm. That that was fairly recently. Have yeah, yeah. Them? Have you seen them recently? No. No, the last time. Um, oh, I'm trying on to see if I can get the numbers right. Uh, seven, eight. The last one I saw was episode eight, and that was when it was released in the cinema. The the last Jedi. Yeah. Right. Okay. And you didn't. Um, you didn't go and see the final one. No, I didn't. By that time, I was sort of. I. I, I did. I did want to see it and see how that trilogy came to an end. But at the same time, I was kind of. I was a bit bored of the series. I was a bit fatigued, mm-hmm. and I felt like it was just constant being barraged by Star Wars stuff. Yeah. So I'm, like the general viewer. Someone who likes Star Wars might watch the films once in a while but yeah I don't feel like I've, you like, I've missed out you have got all the Blu-rays in the action figures yeah 
The thing is that, I mean, I think I'm a fool for doing this, actually, because I can't see it happening unless it happens... five years time for the 50th anniversary but um what i would really like them to do is in terms of the original trilogy because i i know this isn't an original opinion but they happen to be my favorite i think they were the best ones the first three films um i have the originals released on Mm blu-ray i know we've talked about this from time to time over the years Mm -hmm. but um See, because yeah, I, I, why, I do like, not? I mean, I'm not a massive fan, but I do I do like Star Wars and I do uh, appreciate them and I can understand why, you know, other people can become fans of the series. There, there's an awful lot there to to really enjoy and appreciate. And uh, certainly in terms of that original trilogy, there are some of the most important films ever made, not just in terms of filmmaking techniques and special and visual effects and so on, but also uh, the the popularity of the films and how they influenced science fiction from the late 70s going on to the 80s and so on. So the, the movies in of themselves, but also the, the impact that they had. Um, and I would like to see those original films. Um, there's clearly a market there, but yeah, I think I, I would like to, to have those released. So I'm even though I'm not like a massive fan, I do I am sort of like having a fanish reaction of just going. I want to see those original films, and I'm kind of waiting around for them. I think it's an I think it's an idiotic thing on my part to do because sadly I don't think it's going to happen because it's no. one of those things of going. If it were to happen, I think it would have already happened because yeah, there's clearly already think... there's clearly a market there. So why aren't they tapping into it? It's I know it's odd. They've, they've had a couple of releases that I. I do have the original VHSs from before yep. they did the 1997 remasters. Yeah, keep those. Um, yeah, and also they did do a, a collector's edition, I think it was Steelbook DVD transfer of the originals, Okay. which was um, very poor quality. I don't know to what extent because I didn't, I didn't buy them, but supposedly um, it, you know, they weren't remastered to any great extent because supposedly the originals aren't in a good state mm. um, so that's the last time they were like commercially available um, and they haven't been re-released since and I, and I expect that Disney might not do that but they'd rather just go forward with making new content and focus more on the continuity of what's been out there yeah and it's a shame because I think everyone, every the rest of us come out as losers. The fans certainly do because they've been clamoring for this for forever. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got, and then you've got people such as myself who aren't massive fans, but uh, appreciate them in terms of films who are, you know, we love films and um, we lose out because we don't get to see what was originally released. Mm. Uh, and there's yeah. that, that is that there's that wiping out of history. Um, yeah, it, maybe it's one like, day. Yeah, it's like for example, you know, because I uh, really love the Beatles, and there's the recent Get Back uh, film, which uh, was put together and directed by, um, well, it was put together by Peter Jackson, uh, which was the Beatles doing the the Let It Be sessions, and uh, when that, because the, there was all this film footage which had never been released. So all that was remastered and edited uh, together and we got a new film. But there was a film of those Let It Be sessions which was released in 1970. And in terms of an official release, no one has been able to see that original version of the film, I think, since the 1980s when it came out on VHS. Now, when this Peter Jackson project was announced, we were told that we would have his version of the film, and we would have the original 1970s remastered. And I thought, oh, great. So we're going to have those two versions and we compare it and the history of the Beatles and so on. That hasn't happened. Um, and it's it, it get, you, you can see that original version, but you kind of got to go, you've got to got to dig around on the internet in order to find it. Uh, oh, right, okay. It's sort of like there was a big part of the Beatles story, which has now been, again, wiped from history. Um, and it's 
and this goes into the whole thing of so you know rob you've got those original versions of the film on vhs physical media is incredibly important we cannot rely wholly on i'm, I'm going into a sermon we'll get back onto the mavan and grave shortly yes. but um physical medium is incredibly important we cannot fully rely on digital storage and digital streaming because when no. these things go they've gone whereas if you actually have the thing physically you own it it's in your hand and you know you've got access to that medium and in some instances you know that important aspect of film or television history whatever it may be Mm. we need to keep physical medium for this sort of thing because you know it's important and I, I, i don't think newer generations will really um care much for that sentiment because i've been thinking about it recently my kids um especially my older daughter you know she she doesn't kind of value a film or a TV show as owning it. Mm. She just streams everything. Um, and um, she's got a birthday coming up and it's, it's weird. I can't really suggest any DVDs or Blu-rays to get because she has no, no requirement to have them and she wouldn't really, she just streams everything. Mm. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's just, um, I don't think it'll be com- completely lost on new generations, but mm-hmm. I, I do agree with you. Except I think it'll become a niche thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're kind of mm-hmm. seeing that already, actually, because if you're someone who's massively into film and you care about it and you, and you love it and appreciate it and you want to own it physically, when you go into, uh, when, you know, when you're buying this stuff online or if you're actually going into store, what what I'm finding now is predominantly this stuff is now being released by um, dedicated uh, distributors. You're still being you're still able to get the the physical medium with um, uh, with Warner Brothers or Paramount and stuff like that, of course. But actually, what's really starting to to take hold is it's your Criterion collections, it's your Eureka Masters of Cinema, it's Arrow videos, and so on. And actually, what's starting to become aware? It's sort of like it, it's becoming focused. You know, it's niched and focused. You've got uh, distributors who are, ex- you know, uh, dedicated exclusively to releasing physical medium. And so it feels like it's now starting to go into a direction of, um, oh, what's the word I'm after? Um, oh, crumbs! I forgot. There's a particular word I'm after. Uh, Connoisseurs, that's the word. All right, okay. Jeez, uh, finally got there in the end. But it seems to be going into the direction, you know, people who are connoisseurs of this thing, um, rather than vast appeal. Mm. I don't think people are very aware of the benefits, well, the pros of physical media. Mm. And I think the pros of digital media probably outweigh that of physical. Um, to me, I've no, I have a noticeable difference in... Um, video quality but there's a much better dark to light contrast ratio mm-hmm. um, I don't know if it's just in my mind but um, frame rate can be a thing on streaming um, I don't know if it's just me but I, I find the frame rate to lip sync um, can be a bit jarring sometimes going from yeah. one to the other yes that's true it can, yeah yeah it can mm-hmm um, it really feels like uh, a TV needs retuned, and I've got I've got a I've got a 4K TV, and it has a hell of a lot of settings. And I've always been tempted to retune it for streaming, uh, because sometimes um, I don't know what's the word. Um, it's probably with the with the contrast. You know, the lights are darks. It's a bit jarring. It's not smooth. Um, and things are highlighted a bit badly. Mm. Um, sound quality, I'd say, is quite different because if I'm watching a Blu-ray, I've noticed some things. The sound levels on the quiet bits are a bit too quiet and the the louder bits are a lot more audible. Mm. But on if I'm watching the same thing on streaming, everything's at a more consistent level. Do you know what I mean? When you're watching something... And you think, oh shit, I better turn it up. They're a bit quiet. <laughs> and then there'll be a big explosion. Like, shit, I need to turn it down. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I bet 
maybe that's a good thing because it's um it's been tailored for like surround sound and things like that mm. and probably better speakers than simply like a tv speaker um but yeah a lot of pros and cons to both um reluctantly seen a lot of pros to the the digital streaming side of it well, i'm sure you are too you know it's just oh yeah i mean don't get me wrong there's, there's more I, accessible I, I, i'm not yeah it's more accessible and it is convenient and you potentially have a lot cheaper uh, it is Even a lot though cheaper we, we complain about the 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 prices of streaming subscriptions and they are growing because a lot of shows and films are exclusive to a certain platform mm. and if there's something you really want, you might feel obligated to subscribe to that. Mm. Um, but it, in comparison with the the cost of physical media, you know, it's it's quite different. Yes, that is true. So the, the, the so yeah, don't get me wrong. Though that there is there are pluses to uh, you know with with streaming. I'm not completely knocking it and saying we're uh, you know I'm not being a luddite and saying let's get rid of the whole thing. Um, but at the same time. Uh, recognizing the importance of physical media because one you you own it and it's not going to go away whereas uh if you know things can be removed deleted blocked and so on with and changed sometimes yes. a, sometimes a certain thing of a show can be changed um I, I know there's like little things that like mistakes have been changed in shows before um there was a show oh, what's it called um is it 21 reasons why or something you know it, it's about a um it's a netflix drama about a teenage girl who has um killed herself committed suicide and it's a lot of flashbacks to these cassettes that she leaves right and the when the scene where she takes her life we see the whole thing it's 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 quite graphic um and I did see that because my wife watched the show at the time and that scene has since been edited out. Right, okay. So, yeah. Uh, the original intention and has yeah, the, completely the, gone. Yeah. As obviously, the complaints are, are of course, valid. Uh, yeah, but if you find that sort of thing disturbing, then don't watch it. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm sure there's versions of that scene still out there to download or view somewhere, mm. but um, at the original source, no, it's completely gone. So that's that's an example. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm. Um, and what's what's interesting is with so I was tempted. So uh, I really like uh, Batman and Batman Returns, the two Tim Burton Batman films, and they've been uh, remastered and um, put out on Blu-ray. And 4K, I think. And I was going, okay, well, I've already got them on uh, Blu-ray. But I was thinking, well, it'd be quite nice to watch those films and maybe you know watch them in an upscaled way. Mm. But uh, I, I haven't actually uh, bought those because from what I can understand is the cinematography of the original films has been completely gone. It now has this blue tint over it, which wasn't there, which wasn't the original intention. Um, okay. So the the look of the thing, and obviously, and therefore, the tone and the feel of it has been completely altered. Um, so when you get things from the Criterion Collection or Arrow Video or whoever, you know, it's it's interesting that uh, they are advertising themselves, and quite rightly so. Is that uh, I know Terry Gilliam has done this with some of his films. David Lynch has done this with uh, with some of his films, which is that they have collaborated with the the upskilling onto the four, uh, onto the Blu-ray or the 4K, so it meets with the director's approval. That's good, mm. like a Ridley Ridley Scott kind of thing. Yes, well. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, what you're doing is you're you're cleaning the image up and putting it out there in the, in the best way that it can, but at the same time, you're honouring what was originally done. Mm. Um, so it, it's nice that, in terms of the physical media side, you have got that that love and dedication. And that is being catered for. Uh, and I hope that stays. Mm. Anyway, enough of that sermon. Sorry, we went off on a complete tangent. Uh, the Mervenon Grave. Yeah. Oh, yes. So, 
<laughs> so um so where were we last so yes uh romana um does the scan of the archaeological dig and discovers uh there's a mavellan there who was revived and there's a mavellan ship which is buried um and of course it's all great yes it is um i thought i had that that good balance of it's um it harkens a little bit to the bbc radiophonic workshop uh of the early 80s but at the same time it's you know it can't be completely that otherwise you know because this has got to be a standalone big finish uh, listening experience and i think if they went completely down that way it would be a very odd listening experience so it, it har- harkens to that a little bit but it's its own thing but the music is good yeah um so where are we in the story um of course in part one the doctor is off with the lady from the archaeological site mm-hmm. um but well romana's with that other guy is it robin or somebody yes yeah 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 he dies yes he does um so at this point the Mavellan ship has completely um uh, sort of uprooted itself um but it's it's got a force field um well it's it's not a sort of force field it's it's how um it's, it's been en- kind of energized or something. yes yeah yeah it's it, the way it's been energized and powered it up so it's the energy still surrounding uh the Mavellan ship and Robin no then health approaches and yeah, no health and safety at all. Well, it's, early, it's the early 80s. And so Robin uh, then approaches the, the ship, which is still energised, and it completely disintegrates him. Mm. Um, that was a surprise. Yeah. Like, obviously, the Mavellan doesn't care. No, but couldn't get, couldn't Romana's couldn't like, she has an obligation to be a bit pissed, but mm. she just kind of cracks on with things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, what can you do? Yeah. Uh, um, one thing I found that with these... Um, <clears throat> Big Finish stories for season eighteen, um, and I know that there wasn't this. This was in the TV series, uh, but I think they overdo it a little bit here. Uh, perhaps not to its detriment. It's just an observation on my part that Roman is very matter of fact in these stories, isn't she? Um, how so? Well, I mean, he sort of um, just cracks on, does it, and can be quite just quite blunt. Right. Okay. Yeah. No nonsense. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, that was in the TV series, but um, so it's not as if it's comp- come completely out of left field. But it does seem to be much more of the dominant trait. Do you mean she's uh, uh, she, she's a lot less like like the Doctor in, in a sense that um, the Doctor's not exactly um, focused on what needs done, or. Yes, yeah, yeah. So you know, the, the, or or, and, or she she used to have like, like in the leisure hive, she had his same kind of wit. Is that kind of absent here? I th- yeah, I think so. So, as I said, that there was that difference where the, the doctor sort of meanders and uh, can sometimes just sort of like blunder his way through a situation where Romana is a lot more on the ball. But at the same time, there was an element of them where they were sort of in tune with each other. And yeah, the, mm. there was a wit to it. Whereas I think with these audio adventures, it's, it's not that. It's, it seems to be much more... much. The, the difference is much more clear-cut. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying that's a, a good or bad thing. Although, out of a preference, I would say I prefer what I see on the TV series because I just think it's better presented and there's a bit more nuance there. Um, but yeah, it's it's just an observation more than anything. Yeah. Oh, did uh, I told you we did a bonus episode the other week mm-hmm. on Patreon. Yeah. So uh, Matt and Mark joined me and we did Attack of the Grask. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it, I couldn't um, couldn't find the full interactive version online, but uh, it was on YouTube. So I just watched, watched it on there. Yeah, and I think uh, I think the episode ran for about an hour or so, which was good considering it's just a fifteen-minute <laughs> interactive game. <laughs> All right, did you enjoy it? 
Yeah, it was. Well, <laughs> yes, I'm, yeah, I'm convinced by that response. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so back to the story. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so as you said, uh, Robin dies. Um, but then uh, they start investigating what what what's going on, um, and then this is when the th- the threat of the story really starts to emerge, which is. Um, the Me- the Mavellans uh, had experimented. Uh, so this goes back to their battle with the Daleks. And the Daleks and the Mavellans were caught in a uh, sort of a logical uh, impasse because they were both thinking logically. And so they basically weren't progressing. So they were in constant stalemate. So um, the Mavellans are trying to break out of, out of that deadlock and get one over on the Daleks. And... Um, in this story, what they've attempted to do is get a Mavellan and basically make it much more emotional, much more human. Um, but they've completely balled up on that and they've gone they've gone too far the other way. So you've got um, this bizarre thing of Mavellans who are cold, logical, uh, focused robots uh with sort of this idea of making it a bit more emotional but actually all what you get is a mavellan who is cold logical and focused but constantly pissed off mm. just constantly angry um just no appe- appeasing it and uh it it it's cheesed off with the rest of the mavellans because the mavellans have basically basically went this is a mistake locked it aw- locked it up um so it hasn't 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 uh, liked how it's been tread, fair enough, but uh, killed uh, some of the other Mavellans as, as a result of that. And then basically just goes on this complete killing rampage um, and then gets it into his head that he needs to basically destroy the Earth. Um, actually, Rob, uh, do you know, can you remember the reasons why? Why he was pissed off? No, no, why he wants to destroy Earth. All right, um... No. Was there a reason given? Are you asking? I'm sure there was, but I can't. For, I can't for the life of me remember what it was. It made sense when I was listening to the story, but now when I'm talking about it, going well, why? Why did he want to kill all humans? Hmm. I can't. I can't remember now. Maybe just out of um, his fear, his base instincts. Yeah. Oh, unless it, I mean, if you're constantly, if you're constantly angry, uh, you've got to channel that anger somehow. And maybe it was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's just, I'm angry. Ugh, I know, <laughs> kill people. Um, I suppose it sort of makes sense. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the reason he wants to kill because he's angry, and that's it. End of. Um, and if if you're constantly angry and there's no let up, I suppose. I suppose that is the only logical progression it can go in. So yeah, um, so that's yeah. the that's the threat. So everyone's keen to stop this pissed off Mavellan, um, but for slightly different reasons. So obviously the Doctor Romana and their archaeological friends, they just want to stop the damn thing and, and completely halt it so uh, no one dies. Um, but the uh, Commander Narina. Uh, the other Mavellan, she wants to actually learn from the mistakes uh, yeah. of this thing, not necessarily stop it, but improve on it, um, make this thing more man- malleable, and then travel into the future, which was her present, and then um, basically change the history of it. So actually... The idea is that they wouldn't be in this perpetual war with the Daleks. They would have just gone into battle with the Daleks and completely destroyed them first time off. But then obviously the Doctor's not happy with that because that, that changes the fabric of time and, you know, yeah, yeah. and, and you can't do all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a hypocrite. <laughs> just a bit. But, you know, you can understand where he's coming from. Yeah. <laughs> sort of. Aye. So is that... Are we into part two now? Yeah, yeah that's, that's well into part two. Yeah. So, the Doctor, of course, has arrived at the Mavellan ship. Mm -hmm. And um, after that, they kind of, they are on on the run from the guy. Mm -hmm. And he's he's, um, 
clocking a good 60 mile an hour. <laughs> yes, he is. An incredibly fast runner. Managed to outpace him slightly because of the car that they're in, but they head back to um, the, the archaeological, uh, the archaeologists, I can't put, the archeo- archaeologists, um, I can read the word, but I can't say it, uh, goes to the headquarters, which is uh, a former school building. Um, so you've then got this moment where they're all trapped inside the building and um, this this angry Mavellan ripping the car apart like tinfoil yeah ripping the car apart so they, they can't escape and then skate you know uh, scoping the area out to see how heavily armed it is but of course being a former I mean he doesn't know that it's fair enough but he's checking out but of course being a former school there's no armament at all so um you know, the, 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 what do they do to uh, to defeat it? Well, this is where the Doctor comes in. Funnily enough, I had to think about this. So when I was first listening to it, I thought, hmm, this is a bit of Deo Ex Machina here because the Doctor suddenly seems to go, oh, um, I they're, they're disrupted by um, sounds. And I amplified it using my sonic screwdriver, and that's rendered them helpless. Ha ha ha! I thought, oh, that's came a bit out of the blue, and I'm not, mm, I'm not keen on that. Um, but actually, it, uh, sort of like ten minutes later, I went, oh, hang on, wait a second, no, that isn't a Deo Ex Machina. Uh, it is, I think, if you're just, I think this, this is the one thing which contradicts what we were saying before, which is that you can appreciate the Mavellan Grave completely on its own merits without knowing Destiny of the Daleks. But I think that if you were approaching this uh, story uh, blind, as it were, and yeah. you're just, that's the way that the story ends. You're just going, well, where the hell did that come from? That wasn't explained or established. It is actually in Destiny of the Daleks. Uh, and right, the way okay. that, you know, um, the, the Doctor uses uh, K, uh, K9's whistle and amplifies that in, uh, at the end. Ah, uh, okay. Uh it's established in episode one that there's something going on with uh, with the sound, uh, which the Doctor picks up on. So in episode four of Destiny, uh, he then amplifies, you know, he's blowing into K9's whistle, amplifies it, and then that uh, disrupts all the um, the Mavellans. Ah, okay. I was wondering. Yeah, so actually, you know, th- so the, the, Mavellan, the Mavellan grave does actually use that and just go, oh, right, okay. So there is that continuity there, which, as I said, works if you're familiar with destiny of the daleks but if you're if you're not and if you were to come to the story completely blind then i i think you would go mm, that's a bit unsatisfying so i think that i think that's the i think this is the one instance of this story where knowing about destiny of the daleks does benefit the story actually yeah well like you said it is just kind of wrapped up pretty quickly mm. and um they do reprogram the guy. Yes, they do, yeah. A lot more karma. Um, yes, so... what? How do you... T- um, so, they do help him, and then he ends up dying anyway. Yeah, but he takes the, the Mavellans sort of like the, he does. The, the, in the spaceship with them, so it blows, blows them all up. Um, yeah. But that's a completely illogical thing to do. So actually, in a, in a sort of perverse way, if you like, mm-hmm. the Mavellan succeeded, but it it backfires on them. But, you know, that's, yeah. that, that's what needed to happen. Problem solved. Problem solved. <laughs> but interestingly, as a side note, it's... it's uh, um, what's the Peter Davison Dalek? Is that Resurrection of the Daleks? It is, yeah. Yeah. That's actually explained in that story that the Mavellan's... Um, so, uh, overcame the Daleks by creating a virus. Um, just, I, I'm just mentioning that as a, as a side note. So there's this. So you've got um, you've got Destiny of the Daleks. You've then got this story, the Mavellan Grave, and then you've got uh, Resurrection of the Daleks. This is a sort of loosely linked trilogy of the Daleks versus the Mavellans. The Mavellans aren't in Resurrection of the Daleks, but they are mentioned. Yeah. And it's explained uh, they beat the Daleks by creating a virus. So Job they do end up winning. Yeah. But there you are. Yeah. That's good. So um, 
Are we on a bit of a conclusion in score now? Uh, any, yes, any I think thoughts yeah. on the story now? Um, my final thoughts are, I thought it was a good story. Uh, very fast-paced, but just very satisfying. I thought it was a, you know, a, a good, uh, enjoyable, action-packed story, told well, and uh, moves at a fairly good pace. Yeah. Um, How about you? It, really, it was, yeah, it was a good little two-parter. Mm-hmm. Fast-paced, decent enough characters for what we got of them. Yes, mm-hmm. And very well performed. It was good that yeah. it was, yeah. It didn't rely heavily on a, like a foreknowledge of Destiny of the Daleks, mm-hmm. which is good. Yeah, you could get in watch, you could get in and listen to this, then go and check that out afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it, it's uh, it's paced quite well. Of course, um, it could have been longer, but that's not the format of the show at this stage. Just two part stories. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, after rated a good story. Yes, I would rate it exactly the same. I think it's good as well. Um, I'm still hoping for a really, really good one. Yes, that's true. Um, I think of the, it's it's been a sort of a mixture. I think the Beast of Kravenos is the only one which we said that we really didn't like. I think we ranked that one poor. And it's actually the first story that we ever ranked poor on this podcast, just in general. So we weren't keen on that. And then with the other ones, it's been sort of seesawing between we think it's good or we think it's average. But yeah, even though we, we rank this one good and there's one or two of the others that we have, I agree with that. There's there's not one which has come across as, oh, that's really good. Um, not yet. Yeah, not yet. So uh, we'll see. Have you listened to these uh, previously? No, no, so th- these are the oh, first time good. that I've been listening to them. Yeah. Right. Oh, we'll see. Uh-huh. Um So, yeah, so thanks for that, Rob. So, yeah, um so the the next season 18, it's still a big finish at the moment. Um That's fine, yeah. But it's uh d- we'll be looking at two stories, Skin of the Skin of the Sleek and The Thief Who Stole Time. My understanding of those is that they're linked. All oh, right, okay. Um, so to to help with the, that's the reason why we're only looking we were only looking at one story this week as opposed to the the usual two. So my understanding is that the skin of the sleek and the thief who still time are two linked stories. All right, we'll get to them um, episode after next. Yeah, and then uh, following that, we finally the next season eighteen stuff. Uh, we actually get into a run of the televised stories. So we're so we're nearly there, and that will be Megalos full circle stated K. So three stories. That's good. Yeah, yeah. We need to keep this momentum going, Liam. <laughs> yes, we, we certainly weekly. do. Weekly. <laughs> um. So next episode, I dare not say next week. Um, <laughs> yeah. The next. next episode on the podcast. Um. To this moment, I'm still a bit indecisive. Okay. I'm not sure. I was torn between. Torchwood. Okay. Hmm. And I was also thinking sort of Orion, but let's not oversaturate it with too much big finish. Mm-hmm. Um I don't know. Or something different entirely. Do you do you want to go Torchwood? You know what? Yes. Because uh I had uh, <laughs> Oh, that was crap television. I did have a not. I did have a lot of fun when we looked at Torchwood. Uh, I was going to say a few weeks ago, uh, a few years ago, a few, few months ago. Yeah, a few months ago. With uh, with everything changes, which was the very first episode. Yeah. So you know what? Yeah, I'll quite quite happily go with Torchwood. Okay, let's do it. So the next one is Torchwood series one, episode two. It's called Day One. <laughs> this is not to be confused with the first episode of series series three of the same title. Yes, yeah, yeah. I got confused with that. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's all about Gwen's first day on the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, written by Chibbers. So it's bound to be a good one. <laughs> 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 Rob, of this is a Torchwood episode that I remember, and it's <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, not all, not all bits and pieces, but uh, it's the sex gas one, isn't it? Yeah, it came and went. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to have a lot of fun with this one. But yeah. yes, okay. 
Great. Well, thank you everyone for listening. If you've made it this far, um, uh, sorry, Liam, this isn't my episode. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. You're doing so well. No, uh, I'm basically just going to repeat exactly you know what Rob's just said. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If you've uh, survived it this far with the tangents that we've gone on and the sermons of physical media and all the rest of it. Well done. Uh, Hope you've still enjoyed it. The tide is Cloister Bell. Imminent disaster. The Cloister Bell? Yes. What's that? Well, it's a sort of communications device reserved for wild catastrophes and sudden calls to man the battle stations. That's the Cloister Bell. Don't worry about that for now. It's not really terribly significant. The Cloister Bell? Oh, no.